And this has, well, I'm not going to list, there's a bunch of history to this. This goes back to uh, some ideas from Barry back in the 70s, and then it was built on various references. My, I have my notes posted for those of you who haven't looked, so you can see some of the references in there. I haven't mentioned any references today, but they're, they're mentioned in the notes. Um, at least I haven't written any references on the board. Um, okay, so if your system thermalizes, it thermalizes for all initial states. And so if I take initial states, which are eigenstates of the time evolution, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, they will satisfy this, right, because they have no uncertainty in the conserved quantities. Um, and they will thermalize, right? So eigenstates of the Hamiltonian or the time evolution operator, which takes me through one period in my Floquet system, these thermalize. because they're, they are allowed initial states. But they're eigenstates, so they're time independent. So that means they must have been thermal right at time zero. They didn't thermalize dynamically. They are thermal. So, so they are thermal because they're time independent. So when, when a system thermalizes, one mechanism for it is all the eigenstates are thermal. And that's called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And that looks like this. Limit. Since we're talking about eigenstates, we don't need to invoke dynamics. So we take the thermodynamic limit on the rest of the system. Rho S. Right. Okay, so we're going to put ourselves in an eigenstate U N E to the I I N. Right. So we're in an eigenstate of the dynamics. The dynamics is given by a unitary operator, E to the I a phase. For the Hamiltonian, that's the energy. More generally, it's just a phase in the, in, the, in the Floquet systems. And then the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is that right, if I put my system in eigenstate n, look at the subsystem, look at the state of the subsystem, that this is equal to rho s equilibrium at the temperature, chemical potential, etc., that correspond to the, right? So this eigenstate has an eigenenergy, which at equilibrium corresponds to this temperature. And it has a density, which at equilibrium corresponds to this chemical potential, etc. Right? And that's, that's the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, that within the eigenstates, we have thermal equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. T sub n, mu sub n, etc. Thank you. Right. Because the eigenstate dictates that. In the Floquet system, if we have no conservation laws, there are no such parameters. And this is just the identity operator. If, it therm if Floquet systems thermally equilibrate, they equilibrate to maximize the entropy which is all states equally likely, and the, the state is the identity operator. So on the right hand side, you can consider one particular energy, you can write the road with Well, rho zero would be a particular energy, yes. But we want it to be true for all energies. Now, there's, a, there's the question of many body mobility edges, right? So in some energy range, it would be true. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right, the, the, the eigenstate, if there's a conserved energy, the eigenstate has an energy. And at equilibrium, that energy corresponds to a certain temperature. And that's what this temperature is, T sub n. Right, so if, you know, if the system in an eigenstate is at equilibrium, it has to be at equilibrium at the thermodynamic parameters corresponding to its energy density and particle density, etc. Yeah. In order to define uh, Tn and Un, do we need to assume a particular ensemble? And if so, then how is this uh, different from assuming just a microcanonical ensemble, let's say? Well, no, because the temperature is a thermodynamic property. And all the ensembles give the same temperature. Right. All the ensembles are equivalent. And from all the ensembles, you can derive the temperature, and they all give the same temperature. So, the, so there's no, you know, the, the temperature for a system at thermal equilibrium is, is well defined, and it doesn't depend on the ensemble. Okay. Maybe it comes from the experiment, or because I was thinking Well, you're saying as a practical matter, how do I measure the temperatures? Yeah, that's a different question. Because, right, of course, that's a big problem in a lot of these experiments is thermometry. You know, cold atom experiments, it's a big problem of, you know, how do you get good measurements of the temperature? Because if you're just looking at one degree of freedom and you don't necessarily know how it's interacting with the other degrees of freedom, it's not straightforward to extract the temperature. Now, I'm not saying going from getting the temperature out is easy. You know, that's, that's building a thermometer, which is, which, you know, people have, many, many people have devoted their whole careers to building thermometers, right? <laughs> and so that's a non-trivial task. Yeah. Is this different from, uh, let's say, having, uh, having a, having a microcanonical ensemble? Or, because... It is, okay, so, so that, that's my next point, or it's, it's my... Next point after my next point, but <laughs> okay. So when this is true, so if the system thermalizes, ETH must be true, and ETH tells us another one of the ensembles I could have put here. So I could put any eigenstate, right? Right. So if if all the eigenstates are thermal then I can use each eigenstate as, a, uh, as an ensemble. And that's actually something you know about, maybe, although it tends not to be mentioned. When you learn the microcanonical ensemble, which is equal weight of all eigenstates within some energy interval, you may have noticed that you have a lot of freedom on how big an energy interval to use to define your ensemble. And, and it's not clear how to set that energy interval. But in a quantum system, there is a natural way to set it, which is to shrink it down to the smallest possible interval, shrink it down so it only contains one eigenstate. And so using a single eigenstate as an ensemble is a natural limit of the microcanonical ensemble, restricting it down to just one state. Um, but I want to distinguish that from the traditional microcanonical ensemble, which in the thermodynamic limit contains an infinite number of states. And I want to call the, the, these ensembles the single eigenstate uh, ensembles. Okay. So when a system thermalizes, these are perfectly fine ensembles which give exactly the same thermodynamics as the traditional ensembles. Um, but when a system becomes many-body localized, they don't. And different eigenstates at the same energy will give different properties of the subsystem. Now when you go through this phase transition from 
thermalization to many body localization and you look at quantities averaged in the traditional statistical mechanical ensembles which in the thermodynamic limit contain an infinite number of eigenstates there is no sign of this phase transition because all the different eigenstates localize in different places in the Hilbert space and the average doesn't do anything right? so the traditional ensembles cannot see this phase transition right? this phase transition is not in the thermodynamics it's only in the dynamics but it's also in the eigenstates and so that means these ensembles which are this limit of the microcanonical ensemble down to one state these ensembles are in a certain sense more powerful than the traditional statistical mechanical ensembles because they can actually see the space transition uh, they're not practical for doing calculations except on a computer right? the traditional statistical mechanical ensembles are nice because there's a lot of systems where you can actually just do calculations <laughs> and you know it makes things easy Whereas getting exact eigenstates of a non-trivial quantum system, that's not easy. Right. Okay, so these are these can be viewed as limits of microcanonical. But they're different in that respect from microcanonical. Right. The usual way to do microcanonical, you take the thermodynamic limit, it contains an infinite number of states. Whereas this limit, it only contains one state even in the thermodynamic limit. Right. So in that sense, it's somehow fundamentally different than the, than the microcanonical ensemble. Okay. Now let's get back to Newton's equations. Right. So, there's some understanding of how generic, nonlinear, classical dynamical systems go to thermal equilibrium. Nonlinear dynamics makes chaos, nearby trajectories diverge, and so the system explores the space randomly. And basically, the dynamics generates a random trajectory in the, in the space, and that's how uh, you get thermalization to the extent you get it in classical systems. It comes from, comes from the chaos. Now, quantum many-body systems, the dynamics is not chaotic. It's just a bunch of phases. It's, it's quasi-periodic on the full system. Right? The full system, all that's happening is there's some rotations happening in Hilbert space with phases, and that's it. It's not chaotic. Um, and so, where did the chaos go? Right? So we know you take the quantum system and then you take the classical limit, the chaos is going to emerge. So where is it hidden in the quantum system? It's hidden not in the dynamics, but in the eigenstates themselves. So each eigenstate contains within it the thermal equilibrium distribution. Right? So you don't get the thermal equilibrium from the dynamics. You just get it from the properties of the eigenstates in the quantum system. This, this basically here says each eigenstate contains within it thermal equilibrium. And that's where the chaos is hidden. Even though the dynamics is not chaotic. Is it obvious how classical mechanics emerges from quantum mechanics? No, it isn't. <laughs> no. You know, it has to do with all sorts of details of the matrix. Right, so the dynamics is given by off-diagonal terms, you know, and, and you know, how the... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not obvious. It's all hidden in matrix elements of operators. Right? Local operators have interesting <laughs> non-trivial structure off the diagonal. Right? So, so I told you one thing about ETH, which is, you know, what does it look like in one eigenstate? So there's an additional part of ETH, which is about the dynamics, what do operators look like in terms of what they look like off the diagonal in the basis of the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian? So that's another part of ETH which I'm not going to talk about. And that's where all the dynamics is. And somehow, now in the way Shrednitsky presents that, he just says, oh, those are effectively random 
things off the diagonal. It's not true. They're not random. They have a lot of structure such that classical dynamics emerges in the limit h bar. So there's a lot of detailed structure there, not understood that well, but it must be there. Because otherwise, you know, you're not going to get classical dynamics emerging from Trinitsky's onsatz for ETH, which is just a bunch of random off-diagonal elements, right? Because that, that's not going to give it to you. There's a lot of structure there. But that's something, you know, that's not in my lecture. It's a good question. <laughs> In certain sense, it's in the eigenstates. Can you elaborate? Because, like, when you say chaos for Newton's equation, I can think of something like a Lyapunov exponent or something like. But what do I think of in for eigenstate? Well, effectively, you know, what is an equilibrium distribution? You know, it's it's a random. It's random, right? So, so the point is, each eigenstate itself contain, is a pseudo-random linear combination of all the basis states of the system, such that subsystems look like equilibrium, right? So, so, so you know, if you ask, if you just look at the trivial dynamics, that in terms of the eigenstates, it's only phases, you ask, where is the chaos? The chaos can't be in the dynamics, because the dynamics is, not, is, is linear. It has to be in the states. Now, it's not just in the states, as I was just saying. It's not just in the states, but it's also in the matrix elements of the states, the matrix elements of physical local operators between the states. Right? But that's, again, in the states. Right? So the chaos is somehow all hidden in the, in the eigenstates. In the evolution of those matrix elements? Well, the matrix elements give the evolution, right? When you do dynamics in terms of a given basis, the dynamics is given by the off-diagonal matrix elements of the operators. No, say, for example, if I consider a particular local operator between two off-diagonal elements, like between two states, and yeah. then if I look at the evolution of that, that particular matrix element, will I be able to see a positive Lyapunov exponent? No. No. You have to, well, okay, so, so there's another topic which is just, you know, recent, which is how do you actually see Lyapunov exponents in these kinds of systems with, uh, you know, correlation functions. And so there's these out-of-time order correlation functions, which can see, at least in certain large n limits, can see the Lyapunov exponents, right? And so there is work going on right now trying to make that connection whether that connection has really been made in generic systems or it's only in the kind of large end limits where people are doing these calculations, that's not clear to me. But this is, you know, that's a wonderful thing about this subject is enormous number of open questions left, even though it's such fundamental stuff. No, there's no bad. I'm talking, they, they, when I say well, this is the eigenstate of the full system, when we're talking ETH, we're talking about the full system isolated from its environment. So there's no bad. Yeah, the system is the bad. It's not traced out. No, but rho as, as the system, right? The subsystem. Oh, this would be the subsystem in that eigenstate. Yeah. Yeah, they're coupled, so they get entangled. And so if you look only at the subsystem, it looks like a random, it looks like a mixed state. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the full system, it's going to be deterministic again, like the, the, we discussed before. And the whole thing, because the... Well, but it's a wave function. It's yeah. a wave function, so everything has uncertainty. It's not deterministic. Quantum mechanics is not deterministic. It's always probabilistic. Time for, oh, the, the lecture's over. Wow. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of questions. 